How's it going, folks? I'm Brother Matthew, and welcome to Christian Coffee Time, where we sit down together to study the Word of God. And in this broadcast, we're going to continue on our talk of the Gospel of John, as we're working our way through chapter 10. And there's a few things I'd like to mention in this uh, in this broadcast, so please grab your Bibles, notepads, and pens, and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Now, again, as we're going through, the whole point, as we see, is the theme here, is taking a look at all the divinity claims, uh, either by directly claiming to be God in one way, shape, or form, or through his works and miracles, through his teachings, we see him implying and showing, demonstrating his divinity and his power. So, I, I hope that you're paying attention to these things and you're underlining them and highlighting them as we go along. As well, folks, uh, please make sure you are checking out our Christian Coffee Time YouTube channel as we're churning out videos left, right, and center. Got tons of stuff on, on the on the way and tons of things already done. Uh, this morning we did an, uh, a continuation of our previous video uh, about King Saul and the Witch of Endor. Today we were doing uh, a talk and discussion about uh, Christians and our security in the Lord and how, how Christians cannot be demonically possessed and the the differences between possession and oppression and, and all of this kind of stuff so please make sure you check that out and uh, let me know if you have any questions on that but as for now we're going our, we're going through uh, gospel of John chapter 10 so please grab your Bible turn with me there and we are down to verse 10 so go gospel of John chapter 10 we're down to verse 10. So please make sure you uh, uh, follow along. If you have any questions on this, uh, please make sure you ask. And uh, if it's not related to the topic at hand, if you could just hold that to the end of the study. We'll try to get to it then if we have time. All right, so Gospel of John chapter 10. And we, let's back up to verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. I am the door. As Jesus also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. A lot of people quote these verses and they quote them really quickly. They just recite them real, real fast and they don't really pay attention to the specific wording. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. So you see, Jesus is implying that there is only one way, one truth, one life. You hear many people uh, talk about, oh, there's many ways to heaven, many ways to God. Well, then I guess Jesus is a liar because Jesus flat out said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, meaning there is only one. There is only one. There aren't multiple ways to God. There aren't multiple ways to heaven. Uh, God would be an absolute liar if there was. And as we see how, if you actually do studies in other belief systems, you see how um, they always reduce the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. They always reduce the sovereignty of God, reduce the seriousness of sin. And they, they teach a completely contrary system. They do not teach what Jesus teaches. They do not teach the same gospel. They do not teach the same God. They do not teach the same concept of sin and repentance and salvation and atonement. So you see, a completely different gospel is presented by other systems. Now this brings up an interesting point of something of a discovery that I made the other day. Actually, it was last night. Is uh when I was doing my own reading, I came across a verse and I saw something in this verse I had never seen before. Now, if you please turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. If you're able to, please grab your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. I want to show you something. In Matthew chapter 24, you see verse 5. Now, in Matthew 24, verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Can I ask you folks, if you could let me know, what's 
your thoughts on what that verse means. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What do you think that verse means? What's your thoughts? For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They follow Jesus, but make up their own Jesus. Now, if we actually take a look at this verse, Matthew 24... Matthew 24, verse 5, For many shall come in my name. They're going to come in my name. Saying saying that they are of Christ, right? Many shall come in my name. Saying, I am Christ. Who's talking? Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking here. Jesus is saying, now if you actually study this verse, where Jesus says, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. The I am, yeah, yeah, we're back, we're okay now. Uh, Saying, I am Christ. Now if you actually take this verse, this is in the New Testament. This is the New Testament. And the New Testament would be the Greek. So you look at the Koine Greek. And the Koine Greek It says, many will come following me, Jesus says, as followers of me, saying that I am egoimi is Christ and shall deceive many. This verse is not saying uh, saying that many will come saying I am Christ, saying I am a Jesus. No, 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 no. It's saying many will. People will come who are so, so-called followers of Jesus, even saying that Jesus is the Christ, and will deceive many. Like Joel Osteen. Like Benny Hinn Creflo Dollar. Like Roman Catholicism. Saying they follow Jesus. Saying Jesus is the Christ, and will deceive many. That's what this verse is saying. So on top, on top of many false prophets will arise. Many false apostles and deceitful deceitful, uh, individuals will arise. Many false Christs will arise. And many false teachers, many false teachers saying that they follow Jesus, saying that Jesus is the Christ and will deceive many. You see that? Jesus is even saying here in Matthew 24, verse 5, as there's only one way, one truth, one life, one door. There's only one scripture, one doctrine, one one fundamental truth, what the Word of God says, that there will be many people, many periscope preachers, many YouTube teachers, many pulpit preachers, many missionaries and evangelists and pastors and teachers and and everything who say they love Jesus, who say they follow Jesus, who say that Jesus is the Christ, but they're deceivers. That's what Matthew 24 verse 5 is saying. Let's go back to John chapter 10. Let's go back to John chapter 10. So we see that there will be many false teachers. These are teachers, not just like, say, you know, Hindu teachers or Muslim teachers, but so-called, so-called, self, uh, so, so-professed Christians who are completely twisted up in their doctrines. For example, for example, I was really, really, really put out yesterday, really, really upset because there was a guy I like to listen to. He, he was a great teacher for a while there, but he started going off the rails. His name's Andrew Sluter. Andrew Sluter. Andrew Sluter, he preached a great gospel message. He was really good, but for some weird reason, just out of the blue, yesterday he put out a video trying to prove from the Bible how Jesus burned in hell. 
I, I, I was just absolutely just dumbstruck. I mean, how messed up, twisted do you got to get to be able to teach that Jesus burned in hell? That that is just messed up. Jesus did not burn in hell. Jesus did not even go to hell. <laughs> Jesus went down to Sheol. In Sheol, the place of the dead, at that time, Sheol is two compartments. This side of hell, torment for the, for the unsaved, the condemned. This side of Sheol is the place of paradise, Abraham's bosom, where the saved went. Jesus' spirit went down to Sheol, to the paradise side, where he preached across the gulf to the spirits in prison. Jesus did not go to hell. He did not burn in hell. He did not atone for us in hell. He atoned for us on the cross and said it is finished. And he went down to paradise in Sheol. Yeah, Joyce Myers teaches that as do the, a very great, huge amount of the charismatic preachers. The vast majority of charismatic teachers teach Jesus went to hell and atoned for our sins in hell. Andrew Sluter is now one of them. So I had to unfollow and I had to refute and rebuke him. That he was completely wrong. That there will be many false teachers. As you see, Matthew chapter 24, verse 5. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. So yeah, it's, it's really sad. I am the door, Jesus says. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. By me, my words, my ways. If you love me, keep my commandments. Listen to me, Jesus says. It's really sad. Really sad as you see how there can be one Bible. One Bible. One word. What it says is what it means. I mean, all you got to do is just open it, read it, believe what it says. I mean, it's so clear, so obvious. I mean, you don't need certificates. You don't need diplomas. You don't need big fancy titles. You don't need fancy high education. You just got to know how to read. <laughs> and even then, you don't even need to know how to read. Someone can read it for you. And just what it says is what it means. And how... Even those coming in the name of Jesus, saying Jesus is the Christ, will deceive many. No, but that's not even true. Because as, as it teaches, as the Word of God teaches, only one life. That after you die, that's it. There are no second chances. You do not pass go. You do not collect $200. There's no reset. There's no reincarnation. That's it. When you die, if, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you go to heaven. If you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you go to hell. That's it. There's no, there's no, no second chance, no coming back, no backseas, none of that. Those in hell, that's it. They're damned. They await the day of the great white throne judgment. The reason Jesus went down to Sheol, his spirit went down to Sheol to the paradise side as the Bible teaches. I can show you the passages where it flat out says that. And he went down to Sheol and he preached across the gulf to the spirits in prison. Why? To tell them what they did to, so that they, what caused them to be there of the souls of the day of Noah who died in the day of Noah, died in the flood. About showing them how their sins, their corruptions did this to them. They knew what they were doing and they deliberately fought against God and condemned themselves. And then, and then the Bible says how then Jesus ascended. He took captivity captive with him. Uh, those in, in the paradise side went up with Jesus. That's why we don't go down to Sheol anymore. We now go up to be in heaven as the word of God flat out says. But people twist the scriptures, they don't research the scriptures, they don't uh, rightly divide the word of truth, they, they uh, lazily teach the scriptures and teach false doctrines. They deceive many, even those who say they love Jesus, even those who come in the name of Jesus, even those who say Jesus is the Christ, deceive many by false teachings, by errant research. They don't study the meanings of words. It's really sad. It's really sad how people can do this. While the scriptures are staring them square in the face. 
and they just don't believe what it says. They just don't believe what it says. Furthermore, saying that Jesus went to hell, for example, or he burned in hell, and he atoned for us in hell, that means the cross was insufficient. That's literally what that's saying. It's saying the cross was insufficient. His blood atonement was insufficient. That he made a mistake by saying it is finished on the cross. If he still had to atone for us in hell, he should not have said it is finished on the cross. See, see, Jesus then made a mistake. And if he made a mistake, if he's insufficient, then he's not God. So you see how the very idea of saying that Jesus went to hell completely destroys the entirety of the gospel. So, so it's also worse if you try to reach and haven't done research. That's right, yeah. So look, let's look what he says. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. By me. See, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the mighty God manifested in the flesh. And it's only by his name, his power, his atonement, his work, as the scripture hath said, is how we are saved. You can't get to heaven by any other name or any other power or any other thing. You cannot impress God. Doesn't matter what you do. You could do all the good works and charity and religiosity all you want, and it will achieve nothing. You will have wasted your entire life. Because salvation is by belief alone, by grace through faith alone, and the Lord God Jesus Christ alone. There are many Jesuses in the world, but there's only one that can save. There's only one that can save. Verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. And we know we talked about this last time in the last Periscope that I did about how other ways rob God. They steal from the truth, plagiarize off the truth, and try to, cre and try to create new doors in the wall of heaven. There's only one door, one gate, one drawbridge. There's only one way, one truth, one life, one door of salvation. And if you don't go in by that way, you're, you're equated as a thief and a robber, stealing God, robbing from God, robbing from Jesus, and making Jesus a liar. It comes with to steal, can destroy, to destroy the faith. Trying to make other ways is destroying the very faith that Jesus Christ established. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. That the life is only found in Jesus Christ. The life is only found in the blood and the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at what Jesus says here. In verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Let's pause for a second there. Pause for a second there. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 23. Psalm 23. Now in Psalm 23, many many of you know it, is the great psalm of the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now the word Lord as you see in Psalm 23, is all uppercase. L-O-R-D, all uppercase. The Lord is my shepherd. This is saying, Jehovah God, Almighty God, the Lord God, Creator God of all Scripture, Almighty God is my shepherd. Almighty God is my shepherd. Now, we also want to go to Ezekiel 34. I have it written in the side there. Ezekiel 34. In Ezekiel 34, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but throughout the chapter, we see God talking in Ezekiel chapter 34, where he says, my sheep, my flock, my flock, my flock, my flock, my flock, again and again and again, my sheep, my sheep, I will feed them, I will feed them in good pasture, my flock, my flock, and again and again and again and again and again, all throughout Ezekiel 34, God Almighty says, I am the shepherd. I am the shepherd of the sheep. 
Now, if we go back to John chapter 10. Now, we've established throughout the Gospels multiple, multiple, multiple times. Established beyond shadow of a doubt. Jesus is God Almighty manifested in the flesh. First, First Timothy 3.16, God was manifested in the flesh. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 14, the word which is God became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, it's beyond doubt, beyond question. What it says is what it means. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. And Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 24, if you don't believe this, you're going to die in your sins unsaved. So therefore, it's a mandatory requirement to believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. Now, if we pair this with Psalm 23, Ezekiel 34, and all other passages throughout Scripture where God is illustrating himself as the shepherd, Jesus, as established as God, Jesus, right here in John chapter 10, at verse 11, verse 14, and in verses... Uh, uh, and verses 26 to, 20, uh, to, to 29 of John chapter 10, where Jesus refers to himself as the shepherd, Jesus is saying he is the God, the shepherd of Psalm 23 and Ezekiel 34. Right there. We see Jesus calling himself the shepherd is a divinity claim. Do you see that? Any questions? Rightly dividing the word of truth, line upon line, precept upon precept, here, here a little, there a little, as Isaiah says, we see this, Jesus is God, the word, which is God, made flesh, he is the shepherd of Psalm 23. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, is speaking about the Christ, the Messiah, the Redeemer, Jesus God made flesh. 1 John 5.20, Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life. 1 Timothy 4.10, the living God, which is the Savior of all men. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifested in the flesh. Acts 20.28, 20, God purchased the church with his own blood. Colossians 2.9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. The good shepherd giveth, giveth his life for his sheep. Acts 20, 28. God purchased the church with his own blood. Think about that one for a moment. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friend. And that's what God did. Because God so loved the world. The so love of God is the self-sacrificing love of God. It's the self-sacrificing love of God. He loves you so much. He is so not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He He's so not desiring to have to condemn. God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he so loves you. He so longs for you to be saved. He made a way for you to be saved. So simple, so easy. You don't have to do anything for it's not by works. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not by righteous works. It's not by works of the law. For it's by grace through faith alone. If you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. It's so simple, made easy, so easy by God. The shepherd does all the work. The shepherd leads, guides, guards, provides, shields. He's the one that does it all. Our shepherd did it all. Our shepherd said, it is finished. The Lord God, who so loves us, God purchased the church with his own blood. Acts 20, 28. First Timothy, First Timothy 3.16, God was manifested in the flesh. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Moses, Elijah, and Samuel. The God of King David. The God of Psalm 23. The great shepherd, the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. 
The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. Then the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. We are unable to be able to stand against death, the wolf, and to stand against the devils. We have no, no power, no strength, no authority in and of ourselves. We are incapable of doing anything to appease God. Do, we are incapable of saving ourselves, redeeming ourselves. God is not going to weigh our good against our bad. We are un unable to feed ourselves spiritually. God is the one that does it all. Again, Jesus says in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. Again, reiterating this. And you can bet anything. You can bet your last dollar that all the Jews right there knew exactly what he was saying. Because they'd be well acquainted with the Psalms of King David. They'd be well acquainted with the, with the stories of the Christ Messiah and of the passages of the prophets talking about the shepherd and of the prophet Ezekiel. The Pharisees knew full well what Jesus was saying because they picked up stones wanting to stone him for blasphemy. Because thou being a man makest us of God, they said. Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, is literally saying, I am the one King David wrote in Psalm 23. That's what Jesus is saying. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. I know what I'm doing. I am the good shepherd. Now we keep his commandments not out of mandatory law, but as Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's the same as, uh, as a spousal relationship where you want to do those things honorable to them because you love them. If you love me, keep my commandments. And Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when you love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you naturally, instinctually want to do those things that are honorable to him. And you naturally don't want to do those things dishonorable. So the law just comes naturally. When you keep your eyes on Christ and you love him, you, you spend time with him in prayer and devotion and, and fellowship, it just comes natural. You naturally, I don't want to lie. I just don't want to steal. I don't want to blaspheme. I don't want to break the word of God. I want to do those things honorable. And the spirit of God will convict you and draw you and instruct you. Because the law is no longer our schoolmaster, but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God now teaches us and instructs us and guides us. Not the law. As it says, the law was given for the unrighteous, not the righteous. But what is given to the righteous? The spirit of God. The spirit of Christ that dwells in the heart of every believer. Ephesians 3.17 the Spirit of God now indwells us and guides us, not the law. The Spirit of God convicts us now, not the law. The Spirit of God, as it says in John chapter 16, verse 8, the Spirit, of, the, Spirit the, the, the Comforter, when He has come, will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. To reprove means to instruct, guide, guard, convict. Laws on our hearts, because what is on our hearts? The Spirit of the living God that dwells in the heart of every believer. He, and his righteousness now beats within us and he now guides us. He is now our conscience. He is now our guide, our strength, our provider. He is our teacher, our instructor. He'll teach you the difference between the holy and the profane. We don't teach ourselves because if we are left alone to our own volition, we, will con we would condemn ourselves. That's why it's not in our hands. The law was made for the unrighteous, not the righteous. But once you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are made righteous by the righteousness of Christ, His Spirit indwells you and now becomes your teacher and instructor. The law is like a flashlight. It's now a tool and something that, that we use to help us that if we're unsure about something, we go to the Word of God, which is the law of God, not just the Ten Commandments, but the whole Word of God. And we follow His doctrines, His teachings, His theology, His doctrines, His ways, His philosophies. Everything He says it is now our way. It is now our truth, our life. I am the Good Shepherd, my rod and my staff, the staff of guidance, the rod of correction, which is the Word of God by the Spirit of God. The law is truth of the full law of God, which is which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the will of God is all will come to Christ for salvation. I am not diminishing the law. What I am diminishing is the idea of mandatory lawfulness. It's not mandatory, but it's rather it's out of love that I want to do this, not have to. I don't have to do anything. It's by grace. 
We're no, no, no longer under the law, but under grace. But now I want to, because I love him. Because the Spirit of God now convicts me to want to walk in his ways. I don't have to, I want to. The idea of have to takes away grace, and then it now makes the way by mandatory law-keeping, which defies Galatians 2.16. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine, that those who are of the Lord know the Lord. Those who are of the Lord know the Spirit of the Lord. Those who are of the Lord know the Word of the Lord, and love the Lord out of a pure heart fervently. And that and that if the sheep stray, if one strays, he will leave the 99 and go and gather them as the story of the prodigal son. That Christians can make mistakes, Christians can slip, Christians can backslide, Christians can sin. But that the shepherd will go and convict them and draw them and bring them back like the prodigal son. Who climbed out of the, the pig pen and went back to the father and sought forgiveness. That the spirit of God will convict you and draw you back. So you see, those who are of the Lord will know the Lord, will be convicted about the Lord, and that they will, they will show evidence, evidence of the conviction. I am the good shepherd. Is he your shepherd? As the Father knoweth me, and even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Now, what is he referring to? Not of this fold. What's he talking about? The Jews... He's talking about the Jews, the fold of the Jews, other sheep, which are what? The Gentiles, that in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, all are one in Christ. As we even see in the Old Testament. Yeah, so you see even James chapter 2, which you're quoting there, James chapter 2 is written to Christians who are already saved, and it's talking about charity and Christian behavior for the purpose of promotion of the faith, not maintenance of salvation. This That's paired with 1 Peter 3.15, about sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to them who come and ask you of the hope within you, meekness and fear. Why are they coming to ask you about the hope within you? Because they see evidence. They see something in your life that draws them and convicts them that intrigues them that and your works are a form of witnessing a promotion a proliferation of the faith of demonstrating your love not maintenance for salvation but of demonstration of love demonstration of belief that's what works working out your salvation is carrying out like evangelism preaching and teaching you're not doing this to get yourself saved or to maintain your salvation you're doing this because you love the lord it's like you're hired you have the job now do the work not so you can't and you can't be fired that's the thing you can't be fired you can't lose your salvation your salvation cannot be taken away once saved always saved is established doctrine otherwise it's works to works to earn to gain it so yeah is that the works are demonstration the law is that which we carry up because we want to because we love him it's the law of the land of our kingdom which is the kingdom of heaven we carry out the the, the, the law the rules the protocols of our kingdom of our father our god our shepherd. The Father knoweth me, and even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, so the Gentiles. In the Old Testament, we also saw this, where in the Old Testament, that many, many, many Gentiles were also saved. Where, for example, 120,000 Gentile Ninevites, by the preaching of Jonah, got saved. They were the, the Assyrians, the Gentile Ninevites. 120,000 got saved by the preaching of Jonah. Nebuchadnezzar, Gentile Emperor of Babylon, got saved and wrote Daniel chapter 4. Tons and tons and tons of people of the Gentiles also got saved by the preaching of the prophets. They went out and taught and, and preached. and We even see Pharaoh Nebo, Pharaoh Nebo of Egypt, was a saved man, a believer in Jehovah God. Think about that one for a moment. So you see, not just Israel was saved, that other outside of Israel could be saved, but they believed upon the Lord. Well, well how did that work? Because it had to be a blood atonement. Yeah, the high priest once a year would go in with a blood sacrifice atonement for all. For every single believer within Israel, outside of Israel, a one-time uh, blood atonement once yearly by the high priest would be sacrificed on the altar before God for, for the sins of all that believed. 
just like a picture of Jesus Christ, our high priest, and by his atonement, by the atonement of his blood, a one-time atonement of blood for all who would believe, whether Jew or Gentile. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold in one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. What is Jesus saying there? In John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, Jesus flat out says, I have power over life and death. Okay, let's just pause there for a moment. If we go throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus claiming to be the I Am, claiming to be the Christ Messiah, which is the mighty God, everlasting Father of, of Isaiah 9.6 and Micah 5.2, Jesus accepting worship, Jesus forgiving sins, Jesus raising the dead, Jesus having power over Satan, Jesus knowing all the scriptures, Jesus having authority to, to alter the dispensation of scripture. And then Jesus says in John 10, uh, 17 and 18, I have power over life and death. I lay down my life when I want to, and I can take it back when I want to. No man taketh it from me. Power over life and death. And then Jesus, if we skip ahead to John, John chapter 10, verses 27, 28, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Jesus says, I'm the one that gives eternal life. So from all of these things where Jesus is worshipped, Jesus forgives sins, Jesus claims the names of God, Jesus has power over life and death, Jesus gives eternal life, Jesus has power over Satan, Jesus can alter the scriptures as he wants. You see in Matthew 6, 7, and 8, Jesus says, you have heard of old time and said this, but, but I say unto you. Uh, no one has authority to change a, a, a book but the author. But the author. Jesus is the author of Scripture, God of Scripture. So you see right here, when you pair all of these thing to, things together, I am the door, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. If you believe in me, you'll be given everlasting life by me. I will give you everlasting life. I have power over life and death. Who's Jesus? Well, again... Jesus is the Christ, the mighty God manifested in the flesh. And Jesus also says, my words, if you believe my words, come follow me. Jesus says, not one jot, no one tittle shall always pass from the word of the law to all be fulfilled. The word is preserved unto all generations. Psalms chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. The word of God is preserved unto all generations. His word is above his very name. How high and holy is the name of Jesus Christ? Someone tell me. Someone tell me. How high and holy, how powerful is the name of Jesus Christ? How powerful. Hey, thanks for joining in. Well, if we take a look at the names uh, names of God, it says, There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That the name of God is so powerful, even the, even devils tremble at the name of God. That all, all creation trembles at, at the presence of God. And when the, at the name of God, we see Jesus even speaking his name. He says, I am. And all the people in the garden fell over backwards. The soldiers that came to arrest him. The name of God is so powerful. And is the name above all names. At whose, uh, at whose name every knee will bow and every tongue shall swear. God says, my words. My words are above my name. My words are above my name. Think about that one for a moment. So if his word is above his name, and he says it's preserved unto all generations, and he says, I am the door, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And he it says it's all preserved unto all, all generations. Then what it says 
is what it means. And that those who would come to try to change it, those who would dare try to alter it, those who would try to teach some other doctrine, which ye have, which ye have not been taught, ye have not been told, those who would try to teach new things are accursed of God and have not the love of God in them. Though they may say, Matthew chapter 24, verse 5. Matthew chapter 24, verse 5. Read that. What does it say? Matthew 24, verse 5. For many shall come in my name as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus. For many shall come in my name, saying I am Christ. That in the Greek that means that egoimi is Christos, is Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. That God is Christ. They may even say that. That God is Christ. And shall deceive many. There's only one truth. There's only one doctrine. There's only one way. There's only one life. There's only one interpretation. As you see by 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20-21. to 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the Scriptures came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God speak as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. There's, it is not open to personal interpretation. What it says is what it means. That's it. Period. End of argument. End of story. The buck stops here. Any opinion, doctrine, teaching, or ideology that contradicts Scripture even remotely, even remotely, is not of God. Let God be true, and every man a liar. What God hath said, what God has established, let no man put asunder. There's only one truth, and that truth is what the Holy Scriptures flat out say. Anyone who would try to tell you differently, is not of God. As we see here, Jesus says, If you love me, do what I say. If you be my friends, do what I say. If you be my disciples, come, pick up your cross, follow me. What does the scripture say? If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Apostle Paul says, I have learned it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. My flesh wars with my spirit, and I cannot do the things I would. The things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. A wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this body of sin, said the Apostle Paul. Sin can easily beset us. Sin can trouble us. But he is the sin cast the first stone. If any man say he has not sinned, he's a liar. As the Bible says, the truth is not in him. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All are fallen away. All are become corrupt. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. And we, can't, we can't go five minutes without sinning by way of thought, word, or action. But how can we overcome this? What does Scripture say? What does Scripture say? How do we fight back against sin? Well, the first thing you have to do is acknowledge that it is sin. The second thing you have to do is now bring it to the Lord and fall before His face in humility, in sincerity, and in truth. If you really, truly, truly, honestly, sincerely want to be free, you will do anything and everything you possibly can to get away from it. As Jesus even gave the examples of the metaphors, the allegories of plucking out your eye, cutting off your hand, or cutting off your foot, that sometimes sometimes you have to go to drastic measures. Like, for example, let's say you brought up the, to the topic of pornography, of uh, Getting rid of your phone for a while. That's where you're getting it from. Turning off your Wi-Fi. Throw, uh, uh, unsubscribe, unfollow, delete, remove, get rid of. Purge it out of your life for a while until you can get a hold of it. So you can get a handle of that. 
If you truly, truly love the Lord, you, you will do anything, everything you possibly can to get rid of it. But the problem is, well, it shows that you want it then. It shows you're not truly repentant. You're not truly repentant of it. You see it as an escape instead of the Lord as your escape. You're trusting in that rather than the Word of God. You run to that rather than prayer and fasting. You won't pray and fast before the Lord. You won't truly seek the Lord. You are not truly repentant. So that's why it's a hold over you. That's why it's a fortress over you. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. That, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The sword of the word of God. The armor of God. If you truly want to be free, you'll fast and pray and truly get rid of it. And, and don't put it off. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Don't plan tomorrow. Do it today. Get it over with right now. There's wash, rinse, repent, fall before the Lord. Kneel down and plead the Lord's forgiveness. Ask Him to forgive you and to purge it away. Rebuke those devils. Get it out of your life. Enough is enough. Get it done. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. All who come to me will find salvation, will find repentance, will find atonement, will find redemption, the Lord says. Do it. Do it now. Get it over with now. That, that today is the day of salvation. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the mighty God manifested in the flesh? Then quote his name, state his name, believe in his name, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And trust in him, repent of your sins, turn to the Lord, believe the word of God. Sin is sin, abomination is abomination, and has no business in our lives. Purge yourself clean, clean, uh, uh, clean today. Fall before the Lord. Repent before the Lord. Except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, for that the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Don't use sin as a crutch. Don't use the liberty of Christ and the grace of Christ as a crutch. Using the liberty of Christ as liberty to sin. Our liberty in Christ is to, is to be able to come boldly before the throne of the Father, to be able to fall before Him and seek His face. If my people, which are called by my name, should humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and hear of their land. But, Psalm 66, 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Proverbs 28, verse 9, If I turn away my ear from hearing the law, even my prayer shall be abomination. So, wash your hands in innocency. Is it possible for a Christian to sin? Is it possible for a Christian to sin? So, let's, let's walk through this. Uh, Dia Pro. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the mighty God, manifested in the flesh? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the mighty God, manifested in the flesh? Have you personally called upon him and told him that you accept him as your God and Savior and ask him to forgive you of your sins and Savior? Have you done that? that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Does that have? Do you believe that salvation is by grace through faith through belief alone? Or do you believe that water baptism is also a requirement? Do you believe you have to try to maintain to keep your salvation? Do you believe you could lose your salvation or have it taken away? Or do you believe that salvation is permanent? As the scripture hath said. Because as the word of God teaches, salvation cannot be lost. The very fact that you confess Christ is fruit. Because no man can say that Jesus is their Lord but by the Holy Ghost. 
No man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. This is what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. That ye may know that ye have eternal life because you have believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, 1 John 5, 13. That, is that the fruit is the confession of faith, of belief, on, on the true gospel of the true Lord God, Jesus Christ, of true salvation by grace, through faith, by belief, alone. That the word of God says the very fact that you can confess that shows you are saved and you struggle with sin like every single other person. It's time to put an end to apathy. It's time to take the faith seriously. As seriously as God takes it, seeing sin how God sees it. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, and the Lord, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Are you truly, truly, truly repentant of your sin? Are you truly repentant, truly grieving, truly sorrowful over the sin that, that, that easily besets you? Are you sick to death of these things that take you back again and again? And you constantly again and again come before the Lord in heaviness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1, I have determined this in myself that I will not return again to thee in heaviness. Do you determine yourself? Enough is enough. Then fall before the Lord right now and tell him. Take it as seriously as he sees it. There is not one Christian that doesn't make mistakes. It's not about the fall. It's about the getting back up. As it says, a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. A righteous man falls seven times and rises again. How many times should, I forget, should he be forgiven? Seventy times seven. It, it's, it's, there's no, no count to it. The Lord's mercy, his grace, his patience is eternal. What the Lord says is established. The Lord forgives. He will always forgive. The Lord so loves you. What does the Lord say? What the Lord has established. And the Lord says in Hebrews 8, 12, And I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. God chooses to forgive and forget your sins. That's how merciful he is. If all sins repented of, he will he cast it away as far as the east is from the west. He throws it out of sight, forgotten, forgiven and forgotten. But how can that happen for me? If we confess our sins, if thou shalt confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And all sins shall be forgiven them to the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith ever they shall blaspheme. All sin is sin before God. All sin is horrible. All sin is abominable. But the Lord promises, those who come to me I will no wise cast out. No man can pluck you out of my hand, meaning you can't pluck yourself out either. That if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He is our mediator. 1 Timothy 2, 5. He's our advocate. 1 John 2, 1. He's our redeemer. Ephesians 1, 7. He's our salvation. He is our shepherd. The shepherd does not deny his sheep. The sheep may wander, but he will go and gather that one back. He will draw them, convict them. John 16, verse 8, He'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He'll convict you, instruct you, guide you, guard you, and that which is in teaching you the difference between the holy and the profane. And we just trust the Lord. Take Him at His word. That what it says is what it means. What the Lord says about immorality and all sin. All sin is sin, and all sin is to be despised. Touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Be holy as I am holy. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Abstain from every appearance of evil. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I will allow no corrupt communication to be seated on my mouth. And everything that I do, even in eating and drinking, dwell to the glory of God. Meditating on the word of God day and night. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How's your devotional time? How's your scriptural memorization coming along? 
How much time do you spend in the word of God? How much time do you spend in the things of the world? That shows you your priority. If you truly, truly love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it'll show by how, and how much time you spend in your own personal devotional time and in prayer and in discussion and love of the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? And exactly, don't focus on the fall. Don't focus on the sin. The sin is bad. Repent of that. Keep a short account with God. Repent of sin. Repent of those things. Turn away from it. Fight against it. Resist the devil that he may flee. Give no place to the devil. But walk in penitence. Walk in love. Walk in holiness. Walk in closeness with the Lord. Walk in mindfulness with Christ. What does the Lord say? If the Lord would not find it honorable, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Delete, remove, unsubscribe, throw away, toss in the garbage. Get away from them. Whatever it is. Whatever it may be. Turn it off. Stop listening to it. Stop talking about it. Stop looking at it. Get away from it. Flee it. As Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife and she was trying to seduce him. He, as she grabbed hold of his coat. He just tore his coat off and just booked it out of there. He just ran. Flee fornication. Flee idolatry. Flee sin. And flee into the arms. Run into the arms of the Lord. Run into the arms of Scripture. What does the Word of God say? But God says, I am the door, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the light, I am the bread, I am the water, I am the light of life, I am the water of life, I am the salvation, I am the only way, the truth, and the life, I am the name above all names, what I say goes, God says. He calls the shots of the house, he makes the rules of the home. We follow what he says. If you love me, Jesus says, you'll listen to me. If you love me, you'll keep my words. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. But the Lord says, All others are thieves and robbers, destroyers and deceivers. Many will come in my name, saying I am Christ and will deceive many. Many will tell you, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. God knows your heart. You can go and do whatever you want. They're deceiving many. Many liars, deceivers, de deluding the people and being deluded themselves. There are many false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, false preachers. There are many false Christs. Even Satan can appear as an angel of light, and his ministers can appear as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. But how to know what the truth is? Test the spirits by what does the word of God flat out say. If God's word says this, it doesn't matter what anyone else says. If God's word calls sin, sin, and abomination, abomination. If God's word says hell is still hot and the cross is still rugged, the blood still flows, and Jesus is still God, then that's what it is. God's word is established. There's only one way, one truth, one life, one shepherd, one doctrine. There's only one way to walk. Only one way to go. What the Lord hath said. What the scripture hath said. Thus saith the Lord is the only authority in God's church. Thus saith the Lord is the only authority in the entire universe. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. What the scriptures say is the established doctrine of God. Who cannot lie. Who cannot be destroyed, who cannot die, who cannot be denied. God, in him is no darkness, no shadow of turning. He is all holiness and righteousness and purity of the all everlasting life. The creator of the world, the creator of the universe, who created the stars with his fingertips, who spoke light into existence. What he says, does the thing formed say to him which formed it, why have you made me thus? Does the clay complain to the potter? What does God say? Follow the Lord. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. As much as you believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation, believe in the rest of the story for your life. 
So there you go. Any other comments, questions, issues, insights, anything at all? Anything at all before we wrap this up? <clears throat> anything at all? And yes, all people make mistakes. All people sin. There is not one single Christian that doesn't sin willfully. Every single Christian makes mistakes, falls flat on their face, and sins willfully. People say, well, willful sinning is entirely... No, no, it's not. All sin is willful sin. You choose, in that moment, you chose to lie. You chose to look at that thing, think of that thing, say that thing, do that thing, go that place. You chose that. You, you don't just go along and just oh no, words are falling out. That doesn't happen. Everyone chooses to sin. Willful sin is just what we do. Is just what happens. That's our flesh fighting against the spirit. All sin is a mountain, though, before God. And it's our reducing the seriousness of sin that is the problem. As we don't see sin as seriously as God sees it. Sin makes God want to vomit. Think about that. And our willful sinning disgusts God. All sin is serious. Absolutely serious. Our willful sinning harms our relationship with the Lord. Harms our blessings from God. Harms our closeness with God. Reducing the seriousness of it is reducing the seriousness of fellowship with God. We need to see it like how God sees it. And that's what will create within us a true, fervent desire to be free from all these habitual problems and temptations. That when a temptation arises, it causes within us a proper biblical knee-jerk reaction of disgust and revulsion and want to resist the devil. All those who are, that are born of God do not commit sin. The word commit means to live in unrepentant. To live in unrepentant without conviction of. That what we all will sin, but will ha have conviction of a biblical level. And a true desire to want to be free from it immediately. The moment you slip and fall in the mud, you immediately want to get changed. You immediately want to wash yourself clean of it. You're not going to say, oh, I, I, oh well... Nothing I can do about that and you walk on all dirt, dirty and filthy. No, you immediately want to go and wash yourself in innocency. Get it right with the Lord. The immediate slip brings immediate conviction, which brings immediate repentance so you can continue to walk with Him in righteousness. Walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Don't walk in the flesh. Don't make excuses for the flesh. Don't make excuses for sin. Don't water it down. Don't reduce the seriousness. But walk in the Spirit, which is the Spirit of the living God. Walk in what He says and how He sees it and how He views it. His ideas, His opinions, His feelings of the whole thing. His interpretation. His ideology. What He says about it. it doesn't matter what we think or what we feel. It matters what God does. Yeah, and don't say, well, the devil made me do it. No, he just helped you do what you already wanted to do. He just makes it easier sometimes. That you want to go through that door of that sin, he'll, he'll help open the door for you. He'll help hold the gate open. He'll throw gas on the fire. He just makes it worse, makes it easier to sin. He doesn't make you do anything. He doesn't grab your hand and grab that snicker bar, that chocolate bar, and make you steal it. He doesn't do that. He suggests it, tempts you, really, really tempts you to do it. Be resist the devil that he may flee. Just like Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4. How did Jesus resist Satan in the temptation in the wilderness? If you look at the three temptations in the wilderness, every single time that Jesus was tempted by Satan, Jesus immediately said, It is written. Jesus used Scripture. Because as God says, my word is above my very name. You'll notice, I'm just going to say, Jesus didn't use his name to rebuke Satan. 
I'm just saying. Jesus didn't use his name to rebuke Satan. Jesus used scripture. He used doctrine. Jesus used doctrine. He used theology. He used established scripture. Jesus says, it is written. Because, as God says, my word is above my very name. Jesus used scripture, used doctrine. It's only the devil that would want to reduce doctrine Reduce the seriousness of doctrine. Who would want to change the scriptures. Would want to alter theology. Would want to water down what God's word flat out says. Because the devil wants to weaken, water down, and limp wrist that which is the direct opposition against him. You can use the name of Jesus every day and all day, but if you do not believe in the established doctrine and scripture given by God, your Jesus is not the Jesus of scripture. If your God is not the God of all scripture, your God is a devil and not God. I am the door. I am, I am all that the scripture hath said. Thus saith the Lord. I am the truth. I am the doctrine. I am the theology of all scripture. In the volume of the book it is written of me, Jesus says. If you don't believe the word of God, then your Jesus is not the Jesus of scripture. You want to quote the Jesus of the holy scriptures? What the scriptures have said. So yeah. Jesus wasn't sent to help you up the mountain. He was sent to remove it out of, out of your way completely. And that's what the scriptures do. Rebuked on sight by Jesus... He's saying he used the word. That's right. What is the term for the breath of God speaking again? Theonustos, meaning God breathed. Theonustos. Uh, it's God breathed. All scriptures given. The word given. That's Second Timothy chapter three, verses sixteen to seventeen. All scriptures given. The word given. Theonusa. God breathed. Everything that is from Genesis to Revelation, from the from cover to cover. Is God breathed it. He spoke it. We want to use all of it. Not just part of the breath of God. All of it. So there you go. Any other comments, questions, issues, insights? Anything at all? Anything at all? Again, folks, please make sure you check out our official launched website christiancoffeetime.ca christiancoffeetime.ca and from there from the home page you can see all the links to all our other platforms and you can get all our uh, information and resources we got tons of stuff on there and we got more stuff on the way as well we have more videos by pastor paul on the book of revelation coming along and we got some more things we're going to be posting on our website as well so please keep keep up uh, visiting that stuff regularly we got tons of stuff on the way and um, check out our new videos on our youtube channel as well as so we got some new stuff on there on king saul and the witch of endor and about uh, demonic possession and tons of other stuff we got videos in harry potter lord of the rings chronicles of narnia all this stuff and, and showing you what those things are about what the bible says Check that out. So yeah, do you think God created the universal laws? Sin, uh, or is it just a body mother? God did not create sin. God did not create sin. And the wages of sin is death. Sin causes death. Sin causes corruption. Sin causes the negativity. Sin causes man's inhumanity to man and all of the corruption of creation. All creation groans because of sin, as the Bible says. God did not create sin. Uh, God did not create Satan. God did not create evil, wicked badness. That all of those things are a result of sin. Sin is unrighteousness. All unrighteousness is sin. Unrighteousness is is the personal choosing against what God flat out says. That God created free will choice. He created free will choice. And even the angels, he gave angels free will choice. As a third of the angels chose to rebel against God. And that Adam and Eve chose to deny the Lord even before the fall of sin. Unrighteousness is choosing against God. 
And so all people do this naturally, uh, especially now more because of the innate sin nature of Adam as the word of God teaches. So God did not create sin, but he gave us free will. And with that free will, we sin. All right. So maybe about going through. Yeah. Um, it's not that they created sin. Sin is just the term definition given to that, which is the after effect, the action of rebelling against God, deliberately choosing against the Lord. The Lord says, don't eat this and you eat it. That's sin. That's unrighteousness, that's rebellion, that's stubbornness, that's, that's ignorance of God, that's going against the Lord. And that is what, it, what condemns, that is what destroys, that is what defiles. It's like you don't have to teach a baby to say no. You have to teach a baby uh, to sin. So God is simply reacting to sin, Satan, and evil. And uh, now, because of the sin there, that, that God must judge sin. As a, as a righteous judge, he has to. As you see in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, I, I make peace and I create evil. The word evil it is the meaning there of righteous judgment. As like a judge in a court of law, the sentence of the judge upon the criminal, the sentence of the judge is an evil, a hindrance, an opposition, a judgment upon that which is evil, wicked, badness. So the hindrance, the judgment, I make judgment. That's what that means. And so because of their sin exists, God has to judge it. He has to. He must as the righteous judge. And if you are not free from your sin, from the condemnation of your sin, if you are still chained up in the condemnation of your sin, you will be judged along with your sin. As your sin will be cast to hell, if you're not free from your sin, your sin drags you down to hell. And the only way you can be free from your sin is by believing on the Lord God Jesus Christ by grace through faith through belief alone and His blood frees you from. His blood, de death, burial, resurrection, His salvation, His atonement frees you from that by the riches of His grace, Ephesians 1.7. So yeah, the, the price for sin, the wages of sin, is death. And without the shedding of blood, there's no, there's no remission of sin. And he is the atonement for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth on him shall receive remission of sins, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And this all comes by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So yeah. God made all things good, and then by the free will nature, free will choice of creation, creation chose to do their own way, to go their own way, do their own thing. And because of that, they brought in condemnation by this, and all, all are corrupted by this sin, by this sin, this rebellion of the sin nature that now indwells and corrupts all creation. And God must judge it, as he will judge all things, all people, he will then judge all the angels, and then he'll judge creation. As you see in the end of Revelation, God destroys the world with fire. All, all sin will be purged, all sin will be judged, all sin will be destroyed, and then God will make a new heaven and new earth. So there you go. Any other comments, questions, anything? Again, folks, if you would like more Bible teaching, things like this, um, please make sure you check out our YouTube channel. You can find it very easily through our website, christiancoffeetime.ca. christiancoffeetime.ca. If you go there, you see on the homepage the link for our YouTube platform. Click that. It'll take you over to the Brother Matthew YouTube channel. Or you can find it simply by, by YouTube searching hashtag Christian Coffee Time. In the YouTube search bar, you'll find our videos. which will direct you over to our channel where you can like the videos, subscribe, and hit the notification bell icon so you know when we put up new videos. All right, if there's nothing else, we'll wrap it up there. And uh, please re-watch this broadcast, check out our other materials, and if you have any questions, you know how to get in touch with me. If through any of the platforms, you can contact me and be happy to hear from you. So God bless you folks. God bless all those who love our Lord God Jesus Christ. God bless all those who love His Holy Word. Hope to see you again, folks. And as always, if I don't see you again, I'll see you in the sky. God bless.